A Stanlib Africa Fund has a mandate to invest in companies that generate the majority of their profits on the African continent, regardless of where they are listed. The fund currently has a broad geographical exposure to the continent, with the fund's biggest exposures in Nigeria, Egypt and Kenya. Here to discuss the companies that are moving and shaking on the continent is Humphrey Gatungu. Thanks very much for your time. Well, let's look at the key territories. Nigeria is always in top spot when it comes to opportunities, given the 160 million consumers in that territory. What is your rationale and what stocks are you focusing on in West Africa? Uh, thank you. Nigeria, as you mentioned, is a very, very key destination for us. I think uh, from our recent visit to uh, Lagos, uh, one thing that is pretty clear is that there have been huge improvements since uh, the new government came into place. And in particular, power is uh, an area where you know some of those improvements are beginning to be seen. And it's not so much the increase in the actual generation capacity that you're seeing, but rather the improvements in the transmission network. So there's a lot more delivery of power into uh, companies. And this has uh, the impact of improving margins of businesses, or even individuals who used to spend a lot more on power and diesel generators now are spending a lot less. So I think that has got uh, good uh, implications. We still continue to like the uh, consumer companies uh, in Nigeria, your likes of uh, Nigerian breweries, uh, which is a Heineken subsidiary, uh, the likes of Nestle Nigeria, uh, and the likes of uh, uh, Flamils, the likes. Uh, well, you just can't ignore that consumer story, can you, Warren? No, no, absolutely not. But what I want to do, uh, Humphrey, is just unpack that a little bit. It's a, it's a it's not only just an African theme, it's, it's a worldwide theme, the global emerging markets consumer story. We've had fund managers telling us about all the companies related to consumers from private education through to breweries. Um, tell us why, what, what is happening on the continent that is, is making the, the consumer wealthier? Is, is it a dramatic increase in private sector employment? Is it, in the case of Nigeria, more people going into business for themselves? What's happening on the ground that's driving this emerging affluence of the consumer and b driving this big theme in, in, in investing around the world. I think we've seen some real changes on the ground in terms of governance uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, I would suggest. Um, we've seen improvements in uh, education standards. Certainly, they're certainly coming off a low base, but certainly there's certain um, improvements in that. Uh, it's been easier to communicate. For instance, uh, mobile telephony was not there 10 years ago. It's now uh, pretty much an everyday part of life. So it's easier to communicate. Uh, banking uh, penetration has improved, uh, again, off a low base. So I think all these things collectively mean that your consumer has got uh, more wealth in their pocket. So the middle class has expanded uh, ever so slightly and this expansion in middle class really brings more people uh, into that category where they can actually spend and don't forget that um, Africa I think is still uh, the continent in the world where you still have uh, population growth uh, that is still high enough to sort of replace um, it's above the replacement rate if you look at Europe and look at uh, say a country like Japan you find that the population growth is still way way below the replacement capacity of that economy so Africa is still good in that respect where you still have population growth coupled with that expansion in, um, in the middle class, uh, driven by all the factors that I mentioned. Another yeah. attractive element, sorry to interrupt Warren, is obviously the financial reform that we're seeing, and that is setting the stage for a more viable investment environment. Certainly, certainly. If you look at uh, companies such as uh, Safaricom and m -Pesa and what they've been able to do in the last five years uh, uh, in Kenya, and from the financial inclusion point of view, is simply amazing. And uh, they'll continue to lead the path in terms of innovation. They're now able to offer you know, loans, micro loans to you know, um, a huge part of the population that previously has been, you know, excluded, both micro saving and micro loans. So I think these are things that won there literally three, five years ago uh, that are serving to um, increase the velocity uh, of, of the economies that you're seeing. We saw the analyst yesterday from uh, Avio Research talking about the penetration of, of, uh, of companies like MTN on the continent in terms of getting people that never had access to telephone services, a mobile handset getting banking services to people that never used a formal banking system exposure there. Uh, you, you visit these, com these, these countries like Nigeria and Kenya. What's the, you see this emerging uh, middle class coming through. What's the average middle class person in, in Kenya and places like Nairobi uh, and in Nigeria? Are they working in the private sector? Are they working, uh, is, is government rapidly employing people as well? And you know, what's the sense of, of uh, 
the level of entrepreneurialism in these two countries, in those two regions. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, suddenly, you've seen employment growth uh, in a lot of these uh, places, and government tends to be the largest employer in both uh, uh, Kenya and Nigeria. But suddenly, there's a huge part of the economy that is informal, and that part has been growing very, very um, steadily. The other theme that we're seeing, particularly in, in, in Kenya, is where you've got multinationals that are locating their regional headquarters uh, in Kenya. And what that means is that you've got a lot more um, people moving uh, into the region and the ancillary services there too. For instance, your um, real estate prices tend to move up because a lot more people looking at schools tend to move up. Consumption of you know your basic items also uh, tend to increase. So that again has spillover effects and also what that means is that you've got a lot more money that's coming into that region to base, um, to, 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 to use the region as a base or Kenya as a base to tackle the East African um, region. So I would think that in as much as you're seeing formal employment, I think informal uh, sector is a large part of, um, of of the story, and suddenly that's why I think that uh, your typical consumer company will tend to address both uh, because somebody in the formal and informal sector will need the same services in terms of food stuff, uh, and, and and hence that's where we find them attractive. They're able to address all so sectors of the economy. Does the informal sector not compete with the formal sector? Not necessarily. Um, I think the the formal sector is, is is key in the sense that it tackles some of the larger um, um, uh, projects that we see, the likes of FDI. So, for instance, you've got a company like Kenjin that's tackling power from you know a large system wide uh, perspective. But and you've got the likes of Safaricom and the banks that are trying to uh, afford credit. Uh, the informal sector, um, I think, addresses the part that is not yet formalized. For instance, um, retail uh, shopping centers are very very few uh, on the continent outside of South Africa. So you want to go by yourself, um, you know, everything from clothes to food stuff. You don't necessarily have a mall that you can drive to and do all your shopping in one uh, place, but you'll have all these um, informal traders that uh, bring in the stuff and, and are able to sell that. So there's not really that level of direct competition, I would say. And the informal sector, you can also look at it in the form that they help the formalized companies in the distribution of, of the goods. So for instance, uh, for you to access better um, the townships, for instance, where you don't have that formalized um, uh, retail outlets. This is best tackled using the informal sector, uh, in my view. Okay, so we've mentioned some of the banks uh, and and some of the tech technological innovation by some of the banks uh, in Kenya, like Equity Bank, for example, has been incredible to see. Within that uh, banking space, there are limits, though, and and I wanted to just discuss this because they all regarded as as uh, growth companies. I see you've got uh, Zenith Bank in your top uh, ten holdings as well. They've got cheap deposits that they can access, but there's limits around uh, the amount of secured lending that they can do, which is obviously a market that's a, it's a very big market. If we look at it in an established market like South Africa, um, secured lending is much bigger than unsecured lending. So what are some of the challenges that these banks face, and, and are you seeing these constraints being dealt with by the regulators in those countries? Certainly, I think um, we've seen uh, improvements in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the governance structure of uh, right from the central bank, reserve banks, down to the, uh, the banks themselves. Some key changes that I've seen, for instance, is uh, you've got credit reference bureaus that have uh, come into play in Kenya, and these are backed by very strong laws that now compel banks to provide both positive and negative information uh, to their, um, on, on their borrowers then this information is accessible to everyone. So this is something that wasn't there before that has the impact of, uh, of making it easier for the banks to actually lend. Uh, keep in mind that the, the financial inclusion is still very low compared to South Africa. So in as much as uh, you have the banks growing more on unsecured lending, there's still uh, a huge part of the population that is eligible for credit, is credit worthy, but is not able to access uh, that particular credit. The other key um, innovation that I have seen, particularly in East Africa, where I would say it's ahead of the curve in terms of retail lending, is the use of agents uh, in terms of agents banking, where the uh, Reserve Bank has allowed banks to employ agents to perform limited tasks, um, such as uh, you no know, cash collection or you know just collecting um, uh, and and, score and, uh, and gathering information for credit scoring for people who will then subsequently get loans. And what this then does is that it reduces the cost from the bank's point of view of doing business. They no longer have to set up expensive branches and all those networks. Uh, they can rely on individuals uh, to do that. 
And the sort of uh, uh, individuals who qualify as agents are the individuals who naturally have um, uh, large amounts of cash that collects, for instance, petrol stations and uh, supermarkets that are already collecting huge amounts of cash, already have outlets, already have clientele coming in and out who might require cash. So if you have this acting as your agents, you're able to do some of these simple services, and that has the extent of uh, extending the reach uh, of the banks. Can we go back to the challenges facing lenders on, on the continent and, and the securing of assets in, in that story? I think the challenges uh, come back to uh, we still have very weak um, um, judicial systems. So in terms of uh, you following up in terms of non-performing loans, you'll find that uh, at times it's not as easy to one, uh, trace uh, the uh, defaulters and two, follow up and actually collect your security uh, using the formal system courts of law. It takes a really, really long time before you're able to actually foreclose uh, on a client. I think that is the biggest, biggest challenge that you'll have uh, on the continent. And in particular, you'll find that if you look at mortgages as a percentage of the entire loan book, it's actually very, very low, uh, almost insignificant. And that is one of the key challenges, the security of title in, in some pits and actually the process that you will have to go through in terms of uh, ensuring foreclosure and following up on defaulters. I think those two are the biggest um, uh, risks that you'll face. Just in terms of uh, moving into the infrastructure space, uh, we, we know that there's, there's, uh, there's a big drive by governments to use uh, different models to implement infrastructure. Are there any ways that you, you're able to invest in that, uh, in other public markets on the continent or outside what you're allowed to do in terms of your mandate if they're doing the bulk of their work there? Because we all know that infrastructure is uh, going to be critical to Africa's development going forward, but we're just trying to find out how, how can we get exposure to this. Is there a way that, uh, that you found to do that? I think um, the, the easiest way perhaps is uh, in certain countries where they have launched uh, infrastructure bonds, and that will appeal to fixed income investors that have been able to do that. Um, the, the other perhaps uh, way that I've seen uh, uh, that has been approached is by form of uh, private pub, uh, public partnerships, um, but admittedly these require quite a very detailed framework in from a regulatory point of view and we find that this is still lacking and from that point of view you haven't seen uh, much by way of uh, these PPP partnerships coming uh, into place. So at the moment I would think that it's still difficult for um, ordinary investors to access some of these opportunities but certainly they are accessing the opportunities by way of spillover effects or the multiplier effects arising from this infrastructure. If you look at for instance um, the, uh, the undersea uh, fiber optic cables that landed in I around the, uh, the coast of Africa, particularly the eastern part of Africa, uh, the spillover effect of that from the cheaper communication costs that business now have. It's now cheaper to access uh, internet. All these things are things that we can access perhaps uh, using uh, some of the companies that are available.